deeper into spirit with the reading of the daily word by our meditation song, The Person Well. The word for today is rejoice. We affirm, I welcome each day with zeal and enthusiasm. Few experiences are more joyous than watching children at Christmas time. As they gaze in awe at the colorful lights, make wish lists and decorate the tree with their favorite ornaments. Like a child, I enjoy the special season of wonder and excitement. I vow to keep my sense of joy with me as I move through the year ahead. I enjoy gazing in awe at the beauty of nature, making making wish lists for my life's goals and accomplishments, and declaring my environment, decorating my environment with my favorite embellishments as I enjoy and rejoice in each new day. I carry the beauty of life with me wherever I go and whatever I do. Life offers me opportunities to celebrate at every turn. I embrace all of life with anticipation, zeal, and enthusiasm. As scripture tells us from Psalm 32:11, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Again, the word for today is rejoice. And now let's sing together the first Noel.
we lift up and acknowledge all the prayers in the prayer box today. I invite you to add your own prayers and concerns that are on your mind and heart, knowing that all requests are prayed with by our prayer chaplains and forwarded to Silent Unity, where they are prayed with for an additional 30 days. We affirm that the answers and solutions to all requests are now moving into form and manifestation. And now please join me in a meditation on joy. I let go of all cares and concerns and thoughts and simply rest in my soul's light. I know that my soul's light is always sparkling with joy, sparkling with the Christ within, the Christ that we celebrate this time of year. Right now, I blend with that light and ask for an experience of that joy and the unconditional love of my soul. I let go of all judgment of myself and I choose joy. I know that any experience I have chosen is an opportunity to grow stronger and wiser and to gain soul qualities such as patience, love, forgiveness, humility, and compassion. I love and forgive myself if I have unconsciously chosen to grow with pain and struggle. And I forgive anyone who may have been or may be involved. I am thankful for the many blessings and opportunities that I have grow stronger and more whole within. And I choose to have this positive outlook of learning and growing from now on. And yet I know that the universe is always supportive of my choices. And so I let the universe and my soul know that going forward I consciously release the path of pain and struggle. <clears throat> I choose to learn and grow with joy. I focus on the joy in my life, making it expand. I give thanks for each and every experience of love, joy, and peace, no matter how small knowing that my intention, focus, and gratitude bring more of the same. At this beautiful time of year, I see joy in the shiny gold accents on a Christmas card, the glow of colored lights on a fence through the snow, or peeking brightly through the green branches of the Christmas tree. I feel joy in the excitement of the children and love of family and friends. And I hear joy in the uplifting music of the season. I bring that sense of appreciation into my daily life throughout the year, knowing that as I look for joy and choose joy, that bright sparkle of my soul, that Christ within, will illuminate my days and bring joy to others as well. I believe my future holds the promise of more wisdom and more strength, and I choose to gain it through joy. And so it is.
Thank you. That is a beautiful one. Yeah. Well, Christmas is sometimes a time of surprises. And when we have good surprises, we feel joy and we rejoice. And if we have not so great surprises, then we have to forgive. Case in point. <clears throat> a highly distressed man walked into his pastor's office, exclaimed, Pastor, I feel terrible. I just stole a Christmas turkey from someone I know. My family isn't able to buy one, so I stole it. I feel so guilty now that I've done it. Would you please take this turkey so I won't feel so guilty? Well, certainly not. I don't want the turkey, replied the pastor. You must go to the person from whom you stole it and tell them what you have done. I already did that, said the man. They wouldn't take the turkey, so now I don't know what to do. Please help me. Well, in that case, since you've already talked to the person and they wouldn't take it, then I believe it is appropriate for you and your family to enjoy it. Ah, oh, thank you, pastor, said the man, and he rushed out of the office to go home and enjoy his wonderful turkey. The pastor went home and discovered that the family's Christmas turkey had been stolen. <laughs> Today I'm going to talk about the powerful story written by Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol. It exemplifies everything that Christmas is about. And the key player in this is Scrooge. So when I say Scrooge, what do you think of? Yeah, you think of him, you know, he's, he's um, mean, he's nasty, cheap. Very cheap, stingy. Okay, the dictionary actually defines Scrooge, it's in the dictionary, as a miserly person. It has become a well-known archetype in our culture. But the power of this Christmas Carol is amazing. He wrote it, Charles Dickens wrote this in six weeks during the late fall of 1841, right before Christmas. Many have concluded that it was a very raw, visceral experience for him to write this, and perhaps one of the most significant undertakings of his literary career. It went on sale less than one week before Christmas, completely sold out, and it was the largest second printing of any book that had ever been known at that time. Today we know that there's multiple versions, multiple versions of A Christmas Carol that have been played by many of the most prestigious actors and in thousands of theaters throughout this country and the world, thousands of theaters, A Christmas Carol is playing. And it plays so every year. Our own Guthrie puts on A Christmas Carol every year with sellout performances every year. Well, what makes it so popular? The reason it makes it so popular is that A Christmas Carol and the story of Ebenezer Scrooge is an archetype. It's an archetype of transformation. And each one of us resonates with that archetype at some level, be it conscious or unconscious. We attune to that. We love that story. Perhaps if we can experience what we experience this vicarious experience through Ebenezer, it symbolizes every one of us in some way, for there's a Scrooge within each of us. Well, I know you might say, well, no, I'm not Scrooge, because Scrooge symbolized a very nasty, mean old man. He was capable of great hardness and cruelty. He had no empathy for others. He didn't love any others. He was stingy. He was selfish. He wanted to be left alone, and he didn't want to be bothered by all the ill fates of everyone around him. Nothing mattered more to him than his bottom line, than his materialistic world. And he was defensive of it, and he certainly went out of his way to defend it. And when thinking about Christmas, we all know what he had to say about that, which was, Bow, humbug. humbug. Exactly. You might say, well, no, that, that's not me. I'm not like that. But the question is, Scrooge, 
was very isolated. He kept back. He held back. He didn't let his heart open. In what way do each of us hold back? In which way, in what way are we not expressing our heart and expressing our love? In what way are we not giving consideration to the rest of the world, to the ill fate of others? In what way do we defend our lifestyle? Do we defend our wealth? Do we defend our blessings without consideration of others? Is there a part in you that may, in fact, resonate with that? The several things we learn from A Christmas Carol. The first is that there's many characters in the story, and we, in a sense, can resonate with each one of those. Each of those characters are characters within us. Think about the Cratchits, and particularly Bob Cratchit. Have any of you ever felt like a workplace victim? Okay, where, oh, you know, I've got a mean and nasty employer doesn't pay any attention to me, doesn't know what's going on in my life, or I'm not getting paid enough, I deserve to get paid more, or I don't get enough days off, or we complain about what our certain situation is. Can we resonate with Bob Cratch? And of course we can. And some of us are, in fact, experiencing some of what Bob Cratch experiences. Perhaps not making enough money, not making the ends meet, not making enough to do more. maybe having something that is devastating in our lives, in which case we, we can't move forward with it, and it, it's filled with sorrow. So there's a Bob Cratchit perhaps in each one of us in some way. Or Fred, his nephew. The interesting thing about Fred, and it's something that we can learn a lot about with Fred, is that no matter how many times Fred, the nephew of Ebenezer's sister, Fan. Her son, every time Fred went to Ebenezer Screws and said, I wanted you to want to invite you to Christmas, he was always turned down. He was always rejected. The interesting thing about Fred is an archetype for us and a lesson that we can learn from Fred is that even though someone may reject our love, even though someone may reject our generosity, or reject our gift, or reject some aspect of ourselves, do not be swayed from the path of love. Continue to offer. As Fred in the Christmas Carol said, every year I'm going to come back and I'm going to make the same offer to you, to come visit with me, be with my family, share in the Christmas spirit. And every year, Ebenezer Scrooge had said, Bah humbug! And every year, Fred came back. The question is, can we continue to open ourselves to whatever it is that Scrooge, you know, that, that Fred offered to Scrooge? Can we continue to offer our love, even though it can be rejected? And then there's, of course, Tiny Tim, a beautiful little boy. Ailing. It represents all those physical ailments that each of us have that keep us small. And what is so powerful about the transformational story is that it not only transforms Scrooge, Ebenezer, but it transforms all of the characters in the movie as well. When one person makes a transformation, it transforms. It just transforms the whole world. So Bob Cratchit became wealthy. His son was, was healed and, and became a lively, lovely little boy. And Fan, son, Fred, and his wife were able to really rejoice in the love of heaven. When one person transforms, you transform the world around you. Of course, then there's, you know, Ebenezer Scrooge, I mean, our, our, not only our villain, but our hero of the story. You know, sometimes we may not want to think about our lives as being any way like his, but Scrooge didn't see his life as lacking or dysfunctional. 
He believed himself to be a good man. He was running a successful business. He paid his taxes. He paid his employees. You know, he minded his own business. He didn't go out searching for trouble. He merely wished to be alone. Scrooge felt he was a hard-working, law-abiding, tax-paying, responsible citizen who pulled his weight in society. He paid his taxes. He believed it was his choice to live alone. He believed he had no problems. Other people did, but he did. Do you ever feel like that? If you think of it from Scrooge's point of view, he also denied the hurt, the isolation, the coldness of being alone. He also denied the fear of what it would be if he were to lose all his wealth. Scrooge is very much a figure in our lives. Is it perhaps a shadow? And ask yourself, how often do you defend your life when someone else is asking for your help? Of course, Scrooge encounters the three ghosts, and they are powerful ghosts for all of us. The first is the, the ghost of Christmas past, when we actually have to look at our wounds. We have to look at our hurts. We have to look at those things that have happened to us in our childhood that perhaps are keeping us from opening our hearts. When we close our hearts to those wounds, when we close our hearts to the hurt, we close our hearts to everyone else and to ourselves. The ghost of Christmas past brings up those wounds, brings us into our awareness so that we can feel love and compassion for ourselves, the love and compassion of the wounded child, perhaps within each one of us. We all have a past. The difficulty is if we don't accept it, if we don't acknowledge it, embrace it, we can't transform it. You cannot transform that which you are not aware of. You cannot change what you are not aware of or what you accept. So in accepting the past, looking at it and feeling it as Scrooge did, he began to feel compassion for the child that he was. And in so doing, he began to feel compassion for Tiny Tim. When we close ourselves off, to ourselves, we close ourselves off to others. So then we have the ghost of Christmas present. As we can see when we are closed off because we don't really accept ourselves and all of our, all of our pain and our suffering, we deny it, then we can't open up to the love of those that are around us. One of the things that we can do at this time of year in our present, the ghost of Christmas present, look around and see where there are opportunities for you to bring that Christmas ghost present to your Christmas proceedings, which is to really open up to the love, to share to do some fun things together and stop punishing ourselves or not forgiving ourselves or punishing others and not forgiving others for those of the things that have happened. We begin to laugh and treat ourselves well. Treat ourselves well, just as we treat others well. The interesting thing about Scrooge is he did not treat himself well, if you remember the Christmas story. He went home. He had his little bowl of soup. He didn't eat particularly well. He didn't have a lot of furnishings or great, elaborate, expensive things around him. It wasn't as though he spent his wealth on himself. He didn't even do that. So when we take care of ourselves and lavish great things on ourselves and lavish great things on others, we open to the generosity of the season. Then of course there's the Christmas or the ghost of Christmas yet to come. It's 
perhaps the most difficult one, and the question that we can all ask from this is, are we prepared for our deaths? If you were to die today, would you like what people have to say about you? If you knew you were going to die in six weeks, what would you do in those six weeks to make your life a statement of who you are. We are all called to do that. That in facing our deaths, we can become alive. In facing our death, we can move into a new way of being. Of course, the Christmas carol is about the death of that ego-centric <coughs> individual that is caught up with so much of the materialistic world. It's the death of that and the birth of a new individual that comes forth with love, with joy, with exuberance for life. It's a powerful, powerful story. And so what we can always ask with all the ghosts that were present is, what chains are we carrying? What chains are we carrying? You know, you might say, well, Christmas is not a time when I want to deal with that. I just want to, you know, experience things and have fun and whatever. Christmas is exactly the time to deal with all of this because Christmas is about opening our hearts so that the Christ consciousness can come forth and express in love, in joy, in excitement about life. And anything that holds us back from that, anything that holds us back from that, this is a time for releasing, for letting go, for bringing it into our awareness and opening up to the splendor, to the greatness, to the wonder of transformation, which happens when that Christ consciousness moves in and through us and opens our hearts. Interestingly enough, in the story of A Christmas Carol, it was when, after all of the visits of the three ghosts, Scrooge prayed. And he prayed, let me open to love. Let this not be who I am. Let me become something more, something greater. Let me have the opportunity to truly experience the spirit of Christmas. Christ consciousness moving through me. I invite you this time of year to pray for that. To pray for the opening of your heart that that Christ consciousness can move through us. Do we ever pray for that? Do we pray that we may change so that that Christ consciousness can move through us and truly transform us in powerful ways? Let this be our prayer this Christmas season. Praying for the goodness of God moving in and through us and praying that we are able to receive it. It is interesting to me that Scrooge is often thought of as this miserly person. And to me, when I think of Scrooge, I think of this incredible, He wasn't a miser, he was a messenger, a messenger of love. He moved from infamy to glory. He moved from darkness into light. He became, he moved from the miserly person to someone with divine generosity and abundance. And he went from being isolated and alone to being fulfilled and connected. He moved from caring only for his wealth to giving a care for all of humankind. There's nothing more powerful than that transformation that opens us into being a greater expression of God. And with it came the greatest feeling in the world, the exuberant joy of still being alive on Christmas morning when he was, oh, I'm alive. I have so much to do. There's so much to do now. And he was just thrilled with this openness and this, oh my God, it's still Christmas. I haven't missed it. Can we open?
open every day with that exuberance of joy, I'm still alive. And I have so much to do to express God through me, to be the excitement of Christmas, to be full of joy. Charles Dickens ends his story with, he became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city knew, town or borough, in the good old world. Seven goods in that statement. <coughs> Dickens wrote this story during a time when he felt it was necessary for us all to understand that we have to become open to the world, that we have to transform who we are, that we may transform those around us. That there's so much to do in our world of taking care of others, of taking care of humankind, of paying attention to it. It's no surprise that he wrote it at Christmas, because it's the story of transformation. When the Christ consciousness moves through us, it is transformed. This entire Advent season, I've been talking about those things that we can begin to do to prepare our manger for the birth of the Christ consciousness within us. When we can become a totally new person. It's that divine emergence of God that's moving through us. This is the time. This is now. This is Christmas in the whole century of being. For so many years, we've been talking about that incredible consciousness that's coming to be born in all of us, and it is happening now. And we can be reminded of it now through the Christmas carol and through our Christmas story, knowing that if we open to that Christ consciousness, if we pray for that to happen, if we are willing to truly be vulnerable to it, the greatest joy that we can ever experience with that Christ consciousness moving through us can be ours. Each of us in this group. For when we get, become transformed, oh, the world becomes transformed. So, love yourself, love others, express love in every way. Do not be deterred by those who may reject, but open yourself to that. Open yourself to loving yourself and loving others, and open yourself to prayer, prayer that I might experience that Christ consciousness moving through me. That is what Christmas is all about. It was always said of Scrooge that he knew how to keep Christmas well, if any man alive possessed this knowledge. May that truly be said of us, all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us,